Hi, everyone. I'm Brandy Culp. I'm the American Decorative Arts Curator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. I am here tonight with a very special guest, Kate Smith of the Marshfield School of Weaving in Vermont. And we have collaborated and worked together to better understand this late 17th, early 18th century loom in the Wadsworth collection, which is a real treasure and enlightens us to both Connecticut's building traditions as well as household textile production. I'm Kate Smith and I came to the Marshfield School of Weaving in 1979 as a student. And that began my love affair with these old barn frame looms and the historic textiles of that period. And I just never stopped trying to understand them and work with them and weave fabrics from that period. Uh, and thanks to the weaving school that made it possible for me and I'm trying to do that now to other students. And we're especially trying to keep these barn frame looms alive and workable. And we've started a survey that will collect the data, the physical data on them and any provenance. And it was through our survey that we came to know of this loom down there at the Wadsworth and uh, started on this joint project together of getting it set up as it would have been back in the day. So that's exciting. It's very exciting. And this was an object that we, we knew about, but it was in parts and pieces in our storage unit. And so we, we couldn't imagine it. We couldn't understand how it worked, how it functioned. And if it wasn't for you, Kate, and, and Nevin Carling, who you sent to us, um, you know, this wouldn't have been possible. And, you know, maybe you could say a few words about Nevin, because I know that he is somewhat of an apprentice. Yes. Uh, Nevin came to us because he found a loom or he was given a loom from uh, a historic site in Maine in order for him to restore it because he's a timber framer, young as he is. And so he unearthed me somehow and called to see if he could bring up the loom so I could look at it. And, that, and then it transpired that he came and studied for a week so he could learn actually how to use the loom and weave on it. So that started our friendship. And then he got so excited about the survey and he's got like boundless energy. He started driving all over Connecticut, calling up historic sites and coming to see their looms, dragging them out of storage, putting them up, giving them an oil. So he, he likes to call himself the New England loom surveyor. <laughs> so now he's gonna go to England in a month and do the same over there. So he was just a gold mine to find. You know, someone who has the timber frame background, his youthful energy, and just, you know, the excitement to work on these old frame looms. So yeah, he was a blessing to show up here and we're trying to make it possible that he can continue this work, you know, as much as he can here in New England before he goes to back to England this February. Well, it was fantastic to meet him. Yes, young and enthusiastic. Yep, it's amazing. And we're going to hopefully put together a little manual on how to rest restore and set up a barn frame loom if you buy it at a garage sale as a pile of lumber. You know, just like your loom, there is a lot of them sitting in storage areas. <clears throat> they look like a pile of junk, like you should burn it as kindling. When it's just, if you take the time to put it together, it's this magnificent tool. So. It, it's a magnificent piece of art in my mind as well. It, you know, and, and when we, we put the loom together, it happened so quickly that it amazed me. But the timber framer had created a system almost like modular furniture. So Absolutely. That corresponding gouge marks on yeah. different numbers yep. or chisel marks and, and uh, uh, almost a numbering system. And yeah, no, they're, they were very uh, specific about all that so that people could, and people can, who don't, who haven't never seen the loom set up 
can figure out how to put it together. Incredible. And so we, we had hoped because of its history at the Wadsworth Tavern and last owner being Lucy Wadsworth, we had hoped that it was a Connecticut made loom. Uh, and we had identified some components, you know, knowing that it was in the attic because of the way it was chamfered. Uh, yep. at the end. But because of an object in your own collection, we can, we can better make this attribution to Connecticut. Yeah, and I'm gonna to try to show you that loom because it's right here. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> well, it's hard, it's gonna be hard to see with the light, but this is our, one of my Connecticut looms. Um, and it's on sills like yours. I don't know if you can see down there on the floor. Yeah. Yep, there, yeah. And this loom is all also chamfered. You can see right here. And this one has no graffiti, but it is a beautifully built loom. It is gorgeous. Yeah. And it, know, it reminds me of yours. Yeah. You mentioned graffiti. We have so much graffiti from, you know, mention of, you know, 20 something yards to something that I might, I think is kind of, it might be the remnants of a lewd drawing. That's what Nevin said. <laughs> I thought, really? I'd like to see this. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, yeah, well, that might make ours even more special. Um, but you do often find graffiti, don't you? Yeah. On and I was just going to show you the one that's here. Uh, this, this is a very old, also Madison, Connecticut. Well, you probably can't see it well. But it's huge, and we have it set up as a draw loom. But there's graffiti. Well, and it's a, I don't know, can you see that? AD, it's the initials AD. Oh, now I can. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And somebody told me that that font style indicates it was a font that they used in the 16, late 1600s, actually. Uh, Justin has since heard from a timber framer that they also use it with when it has the inverted triangle. But at any rate, that both that loom and the one I showed you from Connecticut are very, very old. They're, e they're 18th century for sure. And um, yeah, so, you know, we'd like to figure out who AD was sometime. But, you know, it's a, that's a whole other project. Right. Going down that road. <clears throat> the things that we talked about earlier is that you you have a passion for these objects because they illuminate the past and they bring a history uh, to individuals that are often lost in time yes could you speak a little bit about that and the importance of these looms that they had in the home and in women's history well actually i think some of these looms were probably used by men professional some of the looms we have are clearly professional weaver's looms. And so they would have been men. And then there's some that were, I mean, this is what I'm trying to research is the differences between them uh, in the home, you know, and that would have been the, the housewife probably, or the daughter, you know, some female in the household. Um, but there, there is a clear difference between some of them that indicate this was used by a professional weaver. And at that time they were mostly men. Uh, it's just, they, they have endured, like if these are from this 1800, the 1700s, you know, they've endured all that time and we're still using this tool that somebody else sat at that long ago. And to me, that's amazing. And they're, they're so much, they have so much more character than the modern looms that are made today, um, you know, which are all mass produced in a factory. And each one of these was individually craft and probably the the weaver who ordered it you know had ideas about how they wanted it and they're they're an incredible working tool i mean we weave and my apprentices and my former students who have gone on weave the most spectacular fabrics on them you know they're pieces of lump you know hewn lumber and yet they can produce the most exquisite textiles 
So in that way, the, the loom is an extra special object and, and people might say, well, why would you have such a thing in, in the museum? But so you have a work of artistry in terms of timber framing, and then these objects go on to create textiles and decorative arts. So yeah. it, it's, it's compounded in their significance. Yeah, and people forget that every single thing that they wore, that they put on, you know, on their beds, every piece of fabric was woven on this thing <laughs> and by someone, you know? I mean, in the history of this country, there was imported fabric from the get-go uh, that they brought over from England or wherever. But, you know, once they were settled here and trying to make a go of it, they had to set up this industry to get any of their textiles. <laughs> and people forget that. You know, they, they see this as a forgotten art or a little bit of a craft thing, but really it was totally essential. And people forget that, you know, we, we have these beautiful furnishings in the yeah. collection. But people forget that the most expensive thing that you could own would be your bed furnishings, the clothes. Exactly, you yep. Your yep. linens. I mean, yep. Other than your silver, your right. text, and it's because the, it's hand manufacture on. Yeah, so many, many hours of labor into it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then, you know, so it's wonderful that you're celebrating this loom because that's how it all happened, you know, and a spinning wheel also. But, uh, you know, that humble piece of woodwork made this all possible. You know, these exquisite furnishings, you know, that you have in the museum were done on that humble piece of, you know, furniture. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It just, yeah. And yep. you know, Kate, you mentioned Justin and we're going to meet Justin in, in just a few minutes during this program this evening. Uh, could, you, in, could you say a few words? Yeah, well, I got a, either a telephone call or an, back then were we into email, it was, quite a few years ago, maybe it was email or maybe it was a phone call from this young man who had heard about me and he was living in Rhode Island and he wanted to come up and meet me. And so I said, sure, what the heck? So he came up, he was 19 years old. He's part of the chain um, in this transfer of knowledge. Uh, my name is Justin Scorzero, and um, I'm a hand weaver by trade. My business, the Burroughs Garrett, reproduces historic textiles and textiles inspired by the past. I'm located in Newberry, Vermont, and I learned to weave from Kate Smith and Norman Kennedy of the Marshfield School of Weaving in Marshfield, Vermont. Uh, so as um, part of our work um, at the Marshfield School of Weaving, uh, Kate Smith and I um, have begun a project to try to document hand looms from um, North America, early, early hand looms. There's not a whole lot of data out there, um, but there are a lot of surviving tools. And we're hoping that um, by compiling information about their dimensions and joinery and styles, uh, we can maybe start to get a handle on uh, regional differences and perhaps be able to start to date them um, a little closer than we can currently, which is about you know, 100, 150 year sometimes span. The tools themselves have always fascinated me as a practitioner. Um, I've been interested in the past since I was a kid, but understanding the tools and how they work is really critical to the kind of um, work that I do um, in reproducing these um, textiles using those techniques. Uh, so this loom here um, is an interesting piece. I, I have not had a ton of time to spend with it, so I'm sure there are things that I'm not seeing, but already um, some of the things that stand out about it, uh, as, as Nevin has talked about, is the scale of the timber on this loom. It's particularly beefy, um, which I generally associate with earlier looms, um, perhaps uh, as early as the 17th century, but certainly um, the first three quarters of the 18th century. Um, hand weaving in America really peaked um, between about 1790 and 1850, um, when there was just a surplus of, um, or, or I should say surplus, but um, more yarn <laughs> available than there had been um, because of the beginnings of industrialization. And so we see a lot of looms that seem to date from that later period that tend to be built out of smaller timber. Um, and, and you can really sort of see the transition in the loom frames as it follows um, 
regional uh, construction styles also. Um, a lot of features that we see in uh, building frames, you can see also in loom frames. Um, there's not a whole lot of information out there um, about who built these sorts of things. We know a, a few references to carpenters, um, specifically who were hired to build them. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll learn more as we keep digging for documents and, and surveying these looms. Um, so this one's particularly um, sturdy, shall we say. Um, the um, loom is really, um, in this case, sort of defined by its cubic form. Um, this is a classic um, English and Northern European style of loom. Um, we have four main uh, principal posts at the four corners. Um, nowadays, you might call this a four post loom. Um, about 100 years ago or so, the antiquarians nicknamed them barn looms um, because by that period, uh, power looms and small hand looms based on um, power loom technology had become the norm. And all that this apparatus does really is give us a place to store unwoven yarn and store woven cloth and apply tension on that. All of the complicated uh, mechanism that controls the actual weave structure and determines what cloth you're weaving is um, all contained in what was called the gear or the harness, um, which is this collection of sticks and strings um, here in the center of the loom. Weavers had multiple sets of gear like this, and it's the first thing that disappears on a loom from this period. So unfortunately, the loom frame itself doesn't, can't tell us a whole lot about what was being woven on it. And um, chances are very good that it has woven a wide range of textiles over its um, lifespan. Um, a loom like this in the um, 17th or 18th centuries might be used for weaving sheeting, table linen, uh, wool for blankets or garments. Uh, might be used for um, just domestically. It might also have been used um, for trade within the community um, and neighborhood. Um, but then once we started having um, cotton factories here in New England producing cotton yarn, um, in some places these looms got dragged out of semi-retirement um, and were um, part of the putting out system. If you lived near Rhode Island, um, a lot of those mills there produced yarn and didn't have looms to weave it on. And so they would disperse yarn throughout the community using general stores or their own agents to get it out into households where a lot of um, young women, especially um, teenage girls, um, turned that yarn into cloth. Because the, um, the main structure of this loom is so simple, it's very versatile. So a loom like this can be used for weaving complex textiles, but also for weaving simple things like rag rugs. And a lot of them got pressed back into service after the Civil War uh, when we had all of this cotton fabric around. Um, for weaving things like rag rugs, they got used during the, um, the craft revivals of the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, during the colonial revival period also. And so this loom has done a whole lot of things. <laughs> Um, uh, in its past and is continuing to weave cloth now here at the Wadsworth. So woven textiles are composed of two sets of yarn. Um, one set is called the warp, and that is the yarn that is put onto the loom and runs the length of the piece of cloth. The other set is the weft um, or the filling, and that's what we put in using the shuttle, which runs back and forth across the, across the width of the, the fabric. So in order to set up this project, the first step was to uh, wind and make the warp itself, which is all these yarns here. Um, there are about 1,500 of them across the width here of the piece, and they all are measured out to be uh, the exact same length. And that is done using a set of what are called warping bars. So in order to actually get the weft yarn interlaced with the warp yarn, um, we need to separate groups of those yarns. If you've had access to construction paper as a kid, you probably did the thing where you cut little strips and you know, over, under, you know, one over and under. Um, that's all that this machine does or is doing right now. Um, the lower ends of the um, shafts are tied onto wooden treadles that my feet operate down below and by selecting um, the different treadles, I can choose which yarns raise up and which yarns sink down. Um, that creates an open space here uh, that's called the shed, and that's where the shuttle will pass, uh, leaving behind the weft yarn as it goes. So, so I've just thrown the shuttle across. So the weft yarn has been inserted. I beat that pick down with the lay here and then switch my feet to change which yarns are up and which ones are down. 
If you look closely, you'll see I'm just doing plain weave. So the first and the third shafts are always going to work together, and the second and fourth are working together as a pair. So you'll see right now one and three are up because two and four have been pulled down. I send the shuttle across with the weft, beat in the pick, change my feet, and you're going to see one and three now will sink, two and four come up. It also is made of very thin bits of wood and string. The string is delicious for mice to chew on. Uh, the sticks make great kindling. And so a lot of this stuff didn't survive, whereas the frames often did. So we have a lot more of these looms than we have gear um, these days. So my interest in understanding the weaving um, practice here in New England from about 1790 to 1850 um, is something I've been focusing on in the last um, couple of years very specifically. Um, I feel like we have a very unique opportunity to actually document a craft tradition in a particular moment in time um, because of a couple of different factors. One, um, I was really fortunate to um, meet Kate Smith and uh, Norman Kennedy, who she learned from. Norman's from Aberdeen, Scotland. He learned um, hand weaving tradition from sort of the last of the old timers that he could find in Scotland who were still practicing it. And they were still practicing, again, that same tradition that was transplanted here to New England with colonization. Um, so there are certain practices that um, you can only understand by doing. And that's the thing about a tradition is that it doesn't exist in a document. And then we have this wonderful confluence of stuff. Uh, we have these looms still exist. We are just close enough removed to them that some gear still survives with them, which tells us an awful lot about what people were working on um, and how they were doing it. And we also have surviving textiles. Um, and that, all of those sources combined with things like um, people's journals and um, account books and things, give us the opportunity to understand a little bit better. <laughs> um, I, kind, I work an awful lot like a lot of rural professional weavers did in the 18th and 19th centuries, which is to say, um, it fits in between a lot of other tasks, <laughs> um, between animal, you know, livestock chores and gardening and other sort of on the farm type stuff. Um, so uh, it's not like a, a classic nine to five. It's a very different way of thinking about your, your output and your production. Um, so what you're seeing here um, in front of you is the culmination of the work of a lot of different people. Um, the frame of the loom itself was put together with um, uh, by Nevin Carling and the staff here at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. The warp was made and um, drawn into the harness and slayed by Kate Smith um, of the Marshfield School of Weaving and Eaton Hill Textile Works. Uh, she then handed that sort of pre-made stuff over to me and I came down from, uh, from Vermont and beamed it onto the loom with the help of Nevin uh, earlier today and um, got this loom dressed and, and operational. So you're seeing the, the result of a lot of hands here. Um, as has sort of always been the case, um, this loom has been used by so many people in its past and we'll see so many more in the future. Hello, I am Nevin Carling. I am an historic timber framer here in Southern New England, but I currently go to school at the University of York in the United Kingdom where I study archeology span and heritage management. Um, I got involved with the Wadsworth Athenaeum's uh, loom um, because I, um, through my own timber framing, am restoring uh, a loom similar to this one. Um, and in that process, I got in contact with Kate Smith, who runs the Marshfield School of Weaving, um, to talk about the process of restoring the loom and actually how it went together. And from there, um, I quickly became uh, a, an honorary member of the school running around uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts um, 
looking at all the barn frame looms that they ha uh, that his various historic societies uh, have and, and, and conducting surveys of them. So just getting some basic measurements and um, taking photographs of them to put eventually into um, a GIS or a geographic information system so that um, further research um, later down the line can be taken to understand the timber framing or the provenance or um, just the um, amount of looms left here in, uh, in New England and maybe one day all of North America. Um, as, as part of this process uh, of surveying the looms, uh, I contacted the Wadsworth Athenaeum to ask if they had a loom of their own, and they did. And we set up a date and I came over um, and we assembled it in about an hour and 15 minutes, um, trying to figure out which pieces go where and, and the orientation of some things. So um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, the most interesting thing about this loom, though, in my opinion, is that all the joinery is axe cut. Um, all the tenons have been cut not with a saw, but were, were worked down with an axe. Um, unfortunately, because it's all together, we can't take a close look at that, but there are, there are stop cuts from a double bevel axe on almost all of the uh, tenon shoulders, which is super fascinating and also points to, in my opinion, an earlier date for this loom's construction. Um, the other really amazing thing about this loom is that it's covered in graffiti um, from um, chalk on this um, tying beam I think somewhere it says four yards or five yards. In the corner, there's uh, some charcoal graffiti on one of the back posts. I think down here on this, this lower tying beam, there's a signature somewhere. I mean, this thing is so chock full of history on every single inch of it. it it's, it's really a remarkable piece of woodworking of Hartford's history and it, it, all in all of America's history.